they have uh, corporal punishment, judicial punishment, six lashes, eight lashes. I think the highest is 24 lashes for a really serious offence. You're thinking about becoming, applying to become a Singaporean resident, but that would mean that you're forfeiting your Irish uh, citizenship. Do you ever miss Ireland or do you ever think like, what would have happened if I had stayed or would you ever go back and live in Ireland? Hey folks, Pete here from Tyrish Times. What's the story? Not too long to go now till Christmas, all the turkey and ham, sitting by the fire, a couple of Guinness. Oh, it's going to be a good one. Anyway, in today's story, we're going to talk to Connor, an Irish man who left Ireland in 1993 and moved to Singapore. Now, I've been to Singapore a couple of times. I've always been fascinated with the place because of the stark differences between Bangkok and Singapore. So when I got the opportunity to interview an expat living in Singapore, I said, yeah, let's do it. I'd love to know about life in Singapore. What are the pros? What are the cons? Let's get into all that stuff. Let's do a big deep dive into expat life in Singapore and hear an Irish man's story. So that's what we have for you today. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have a story that you want to tell, hit me up, tyrishtimes at gmail.com. Get me on Instagram as well at tyrishtimes. I've got some free time in December now. I'm always looking for some new content, new fresh stuff. i got some good stuff lined up, but I'm always looking for more, 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 more. So without further, oh no, wait, I'm, I'm not supposed to say without further ado anymore because some people are kicking off saying that it's the most overused saying on YouTube. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. Connor, you came to Singapore in 1993, right? When I was, I yep. think I probably was in junior infants, right? Yeah, I was only five. At least that's, that's what I tell people, but they don't believe me. <laughs> yeah. Sneaked on the plane, you know, not, not quite, not quite. So. so tell us that story. Like, how did you end up in Singapore? Okay. Um, well, I've been working, I work in advertising. Um, and I'm, uh, at that stage, I was what's called, what was called an art director, which means I designed ads, the look and feel of the ads. And I'd been working, I'd worked in Dublin for quite a few years, but I'd also spent some time in London. Then I came back to Ireland. And then about a year or so back in Dublin, I was working away as an art, as an art director. Um, the, the company I was in, our biggest client was Dunn Stores. And I'm probably before your time, but that's when Ben Dunn, who was the original the, the brother who was actually running the business, he got into a bit of trouble overseas with combining with cocaine and hookers and stuff like that. And um, his, it was a family business. It's funny when you think about it, but literally it happened. I remember we were watching this with a sense of disbelief and his sister kicked him out of the business. And then as a result, she didn't particularly, she had her own favorite agency she wanted to work with. So my company lost its biggest client and pretty much closed down overnight. So I was left with kind of like, Oh, what am I going to do? Because the Celtic Tiger hadn't started roaring yet. It hadn't opened its eyes yet. So at least for me, things were very dead in Ireland. Um, and at that stage, I was looking through, obviously trying to find a job. Do I go back to London? I didn't really fancy that. But then I came across an ad. Is, there's a magazine called Campaign. It's still in publication, but I think mostly it's a digital publication now. But at that stage, it was just a print publication, which dealt solely with the advertising industry. And the back pages of that always had lots of ads looking for creative people. So glancing through that, I saw an ad looking for a creative director, an art director, copywriters to work for a small local agency in Singapore. And I thought they were, doing, they were conducting interviews in London. I was happy. I happened to be in, I would, it turned out that I was going to be in London during that time when my, a friend of mine was having his 40th birthday. So I would actually was going to be over there at the same time for the interviews. So I thought, yeah, why not give it a go? And um, so I applied for the job of art director. And then like I met up with the, it was a father and son who owned the agency, who owned the agency. And they seemed nice enough kind of people. And um, lo and behold, they actually offered me a job, but not as art director, which is what I wanted. They offered me the job of creative director. And I thought, hmm, okay, if I'm going to take a, take a bit of a risk and fly literally like something like 7,000 miles to Singapore, well, take another little bit more of a risk and take a role that I didn't think I could actually do, but try it and see, you know, uh, what, what you say, chance, chance me arm a little bit. And uh, so I said, yeah, why not just go? And if I screw up, it's the other side of the world. Remember, there was no internet then. So nobody will ever know. I can just quietly come back and that's it, you know, just pretend I was on holiday or something. 
And that's literally what happened. So literally 29 years ago, it was actually November 14th, uh, 1993, I stepped off the plane. It was a Sunday evening in Singapore. Everything at that stage to me was, um, was totally new. So it was quite an amazing experience. Yeah. So that was first my first impression that the sheer efficiency. Then you take, I'm sure you might, I think you might've done the trip yourself, but you take, you take the car, you're taking a taxi car, you're going into the city along by the beautiful highway and there's trees everywhere. In my case it was at night, but I could see this, all these gleaming skyscrapers in the distance. But at that stage there's also all these old rundown shop houses. So you've got this amazing mix of the very old and the absolutely brand spanking new. And then there was all these foreign faces. And I remember I came from, a, from Dublin at that time, it was a very non-cosmopolitan city. So it was quite amazing just to see, for me to see all these different races and different kinds of people and cultures. And, you know, trying to understand the accent, they all speak English in Singapore, that's not a problem, but they speak with a very strong accent. Uh, they refer to it as Singlish. So there's a lot of colloquial phrases and words mixed in. It's a bit like if you dropped anybody off in Dublin for the first time, you know, the heart of Dublin, they probably wouldn't have a clue what anybody was saying. So pretty much the same thing, I had to kind of tune my ears to it. I'm shooting my ear back in as well. What's their story? How's it yeah. going? All that kind of stuff. So yeah, tell yeah. us, right, your first year there, what was yeah. it like to, to adjust to the culture, adjusting to work life in Singapore? Um, okay, well, to be honest, it wasn't too bad at all. It was, um, I, I the, the, the good thing about I work in advertising is the, no matter what, what part of the world you're in, the, the actual role that you do is actually pretty much the same. So it's coming up with ideas. In Singapore, as opposed to Dublin, my, my overall impression was from a business point of view was that it was very, um, it was very positive, very open to, you know, oh, you think you can do this job? Okay, we'll give you a chance. Whereas in Ireland, at that, certainly at that stage, you have to basically have connections. So you got a lot of opportunities. So I was very much up to my elbows in that. The thing that did get to me, though, was the working hours and the expectations. Absolutely insane. It's like I was working from like, at that stage, it was quite normal for companies to work about a five and a half day a week. So it'd be Monday through to Saturday, uh, half, half day on Saturday. Uh, for me, the reality was I was actually starting work about seven in the morning. I was finishing maybe 11 o'clock at night, five days, no, four days, five days a week. And then Saturdays, maybe if I was lucky, I'd finish about five o'clock in the evening. So it was just full on. It was, um, it was almost a startup situation because the agency I've been, have been through quite a few management changes and we're kind of picking ourselves up from scratch. So that first year, that was 1994, I remember was really, really tough because we're trying to, trying to establish a presence for ourselves, trying to pull in business. And um, I, like I said, the expectations from my new bosses were very, very high. So it was, and of course I'd never actually managed people before. So, and get, never managed Asians before. So there's a layer upon layer of complexity and I had to go through quite a steep learning curve. Um, simple things like lunch times are sacred in Singapore. You can ask people to work late, no problem. You ask them to work through lunch, you've got a big problem. Yeah, Thailand is the very same. Thailand's the exact same. It's 12, 12 p.m. midday. Midday in Thailand, everything stops. It's, it's 1 p.m. in Ireland. What is it the same over in Singapore? Yeah, 1 p.m. No, well, it depends because it's because it's so crowded here that you know if you want to get into like one of the into the, the hawker centers or the the food places, they get very crowded. So you tend to, some people have a staggered lunch break. So they might go at about say 11.45 and then they're back by 12.45 or like that. So that's what we tend to do here. At least that's what I tend to do as well. Either go early or go later and kind of avoid the crowds. Let's talk about life in Singapore because uh, I was there with noon in March, 2019 and coming from Bangkok, you know, chaotic Bangkok, right? It's everything is busy. It's moving around and, there's it's kind of i call it organized chaos right when i went to singapore i was just blown away because you've got these big tall buildings every, it's so you've got like that new york skyline right and then it, it's it's so clean everything just works it's efficient i remember getting on the um the subway the mrt it goes everywhere you like i felt like i didn't need a car if i was there you could just get on the train everywhere and so like Let's talk about like the pros. What's the, what are the good things about living over there? Well, I think you actually you picked on that. Um, it's a very easy place to live in. Um, uh, it's often been described as Asia for beginners, and even when I came, went over there, 
it was very much Asia for beginners. It's of all the countries in Asia, that's the place that if you want to, if you want to kind of try out to see whether you'll actually enjoy it living in Asia, that's a good, very gentle introduction to the place. Um, because yeah, the laws are very clear. The government is very, you know, everything's very organized. Everything works the way it should work. There's no things like, you know, under the table money to get things done. And you don't ever try that. You know, you, I think if you've got kids, um, it's a wonderful place. If you've got, you know, a young family, it's, uh, it's so safe. It's ridiculously safe. I mean, I think, I think you were saying that Bangkok is a very safe city too, compared to Dublin. And I, I'm sure it is, but I think nowhere is as safe as Singapore, maybe Japan. And I think Hong Kong is, is supposedly very, is I think very safe too. But it, so that's the pluses. It's a very, very safe. It's very clean. Everything looks like it's being airbrushed, you know, when you go through it. I mean, somebody's gone through it with a, a vacuum cleaner, you know, be, it's just spotless. Um, what, what actually holds it back, I suppose, is, I mean, sometimes the accusation is there's very little creativity here because people are, they're trained from very, very young to think in a particular way and to follow instructions. There's been one party in charge for the last 50 plus years. So, and they don't brook any kind of like, you know, pushback or anything like that. It's kind of do it this way and this is the only way to do it. You look around you and you think, oh, clearly that works. But it does mean that sometimes you, there's a lot, uh, a large amount of people are in, I won't say everybody, but a large amount of people are not terribly like, um, like creative in the terms of spontaneous conversations and things like that. I was cushioned from that because I worked in advertising where you do get a lot of oddballs, you know, even by local standards. So, but it wasn't until I, I did some work in the corporate world here and it was, I did realize there was, there was that difference. And the other thing is that it's considered boring. Singapore is always considered a little bit boring. I was just going to say that. I was, yeah. I was just about coming come out of my lips. Yeah. The, the people, I don't want to say anything bad, but they do kind of come across as being very serious. They're, they, mm. When I was there, you kind of like, because in Ireland, right, we having the crack, right? Irish people, yeah. we're not serious people. We like, a part of the culture is joke, make a joke, uh, smile, laugh, don't, don't, don't take yourself too seriously, right? Yep. It's very much opposite to Singapore, what I found, and I've met mm. a couple of Singaporeans in Bangkok as well, that they are, they do take themselves quite seriously, and mm. I wouldn't, maybe, I'm not going to say boring people, but work hard, they know what they want, but they, and maybe they lack a bit of fun. That's the thing, Pete, um, I, w- I used to push back very hard when people would tell me that against that, because I was on a lot of expat forums in Singapore where this would come up, oh, Singaporeans are this, they're boring, there's no sense of humor, they don't understand, you know, this, you know, this whole self-deprecation kind of approach to things, they take themselves too seriously. But I was kind of cushioned from that because I was in advertising, which is full of these, I mean, by the very nature of the business, you're kind of like challenging, you're being challenged all the time. The kind of people who come into it are also people who want to express themselves, who are quite open to kind of like outrageous ideas and stuff. So my experience certainly was with those people was, no, these people are, they have a lot, we poke a lot of fun at each other and have a, quite a bit of fun. Um, I think as well, it depends. If you get to know them really well, Singaporeans really well, where they relax around you, where they don't see you as the, what they call the angmo. That's their word for Caucasians. It means redhead, red hair. Um, but they see you as actually one of them and you understand their culture really well and you appreciate it. They definitely relax. And there's a little bit more fun that goes on there. They actually do have a quite a good sense of humor, but it's a very local sense of humor and you have to get into the rhythm of it when you're here. So, but I, yeah, I would say generally day to day in the corporate side, in a very um, business-like setting, I think, yeah, you, you might get that impression that they're very straight laced and very like, you know, they, yeah, they don't take, they don't, they don't make fun of themselves. Do you feel accepted there being, being uh, Singaporean, uh, sorry, being Irish? Um, I'll always be an outsider. I mean, that's that's just a fact. Um, I've been a PR here since twenty. Perm, that means permanent permanent resident since twenty oh four. I've been here for like like I said twenty nine years. That's longer than a lot of Singaporeans have been alive. But I'm still not one of them. I never will be because they'll see, you know, the skin on the white skin on the outside. Um, but I I they will generally once they get, once Singaporeans get to know me, they'll see. Oh, you're not one of those expat singer points who's just in for like or expats who's in for just a couple of years and then you're out again you okay this guy is kind of me i'm married to a singaporean i've been here for so long i've done advertising campaigns that have come into the local lexicon so yeah they don't really i mean it's i know enough about the culture that 
you know, that does definitely comes across when they get to know me. So I haven't found, I haven't felt too much of an outsider, but there's always that little bit. I mean, I know other, I know one English guy who's become a Singaporean. He's actually gone ahead and got his citizenship. And he proudly says he's a Singaporean. He's on LinkedIn. He's all over on LinkedIn. And it's, uh, yeah, fine. You say that, but you're never really going to be treated as a Singaporean. You're still the white guy or the white person. Any cons living there? Anything you don't like? Um, it's the, to me, it's a very small, little irritating things. Um, and they're very minor irritants. They're not major at all. And when I think about them, they're kind of laughable. But I was already hot and bothered today by it. It's like I'm just out and about. Singapore is a, has a population of about five and a half million people. So I think that's about the population of Ireland. But it's crammed into an island the size of Dublin County, maybe a little bit smaller. So that means it's pretty crowded. And if you really, you know, it's, yes, it's crowded, but sometimes I feel that the natural behavior of the people here it makes it seem more crowded than it, should, than it has to be. Um, so you'll see that people, you can be walking on the pavement and people will just walk into you. Literally, they're right in front of you. They're walking four abreast on the pavement and you're kind of thinking, they're not going to walk into me, are they? And yeah, sure enough, they, unless you stop or dodge, they'll walk into you. Um, when you're trying to step out of the MRT, the people are trying to, will try to barge in, not letting you out. Um, same thing with lifts and things like that. Now, I honestly don't know. I've been out of Ireland for quite some time, so I don't know whether that's actually the case back in Ireland anymore. I never got that impression when I was there. And it's something that that really gets to me. It's the, about the only thing that does that kind of what I consider to be rudeness. It's lack of consideration. It's such a crowded place. And it doesn't take that much more effort to make things a little bit easier for everybody by just to think about it. Right. So what I found very interesting when I went to Singapore, I remember I was on the MRT and I saw this sign stuck on the window and it said something like 12 lashes with the cane for sexual harassment, something like that. Mm. And I was just thinking, what, what, so what's this? So then I Googled it and they have uh, corporal punishment, judicial mm. punishment, and you, you get caned. Yeah. Six lashes, eight lashes. I think the highest is 24 lashes for a really mm. serious offense. Yeah. Um, do they like talk? Tell us about that because that just blows my mind that people still do that. Well, it hasn't happened to me, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, they they have it, they definitely have it in place and they do it. They famously, well, not long after I came to Singapore, there was a case where a young American boy, uh, Michael Fay, you can actually Google him later if you want, um, who actually was caught vandalizing a car in, in near Orchard Road. And uh, yeah, he ended up having, and President uh, Clinton himself stepped in and said, asked for him to be excused from being caned because, you know, the standard punishment for vandalism is both imprisonment, but also caning. And um, the government, they reduced it by like one stroke. <laughs> so he still got like six or seven lashes of the, of the cane, of the Singapore cane, some special. Uh, and are these public uh, canings or are they done? No, no, no. It's done, it's done in the prison out of the public eye. It's not like, no, it's not like you're, you're, you, know, you have your arse bared to the world and they, they, they flog you in public or anything like that. Uh, and they do um, pull down your pants like you're fully yeah. exposed. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, yeah, yeah. They have a machine. Yeah. I, I looked at it online. They, like, they have they a machine. Well, you're, more, you're better informed than I they am. They bend man, but... you over this machine. I was looking at it going, geez, that's crazy. Because I remember seeing that and then thinking, well, to be honest, sexual, if someone, if, if someone grabs someone on the MRT, I mean, that's like fair play. You're going to give them a, a couple of lashes with a cane. And I'm I'm assuming that it deters uh, criminals. Uh, I I'm pretty sure it does. I mean, it it really depends. There's some people. It's a bit like I, you know, it's okay. When I was going to school before we, I went to a Christian brother school where we had the leather. And as I think, I'm sure during your time at school there was there wasn't corporal no, it was punishment. Gone. Yeah, but I can assure you, it was, it was very much around in the 80s when I was when we, and it almost for some kids it actually became like a badge of honor. You know, I got caned. You know, so. I don't know whether there's a hardcore criminal element to say, yeah, this is, you know, the, the scars on my backside are, but it's kind of is a bit humiliating. So it's a, it's, I, it's probably a very good disincentive to do anything, but, and they do say they, they won't cane you after the age of 50 and women don't get caned. So there is this kind of like debate going on now about, what well, no, if women want equality. Why can't they get caned too, you know, for doing similar crimes, you know, but it's not reserved just for, for men under the age of 50. Um, um, I have to say, I mean, people say, oh, it's, it's very barbaric, it's this or it's that, but I, you have to look around. I mean, I can go out tonight 
anytime my, my wife can go out to the shops we have shops that are open 24 hours uh, she can go out I won't have to ever worry about anything happening to her or anything like that you know you can and there's been cases of people you'll see that he, when you come here if you ever come here again if you go to Starbucks um, students who are what they call choke that means reserve their table they'll put their laptop there and then they'll go off up to to order their meal or they put a wallet I'm not kidding or their hand phone just to their mobile phone just to go and reserve the table so they go up and get their food could you would you do that in Dublin absolutely not to be gone in a second <laughs> yeah. be gone. you blink and it's gone so yeah there is this so you have to you have to look at that in that I mean and that has a disadvantage because Singaporeans who go abroad sometimes they have this they still have the same mindset and you're thinking no 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 you can't do that you know you go to London or to Rome or to Dublin you better be on your guard actually that was a funny thing was taking my wife around Dublin whenever we go out I realized she wasn't, I was seeing all this stuff that was, you know, there's certain parts of, of O'Connell Street, you're walking up and down and I'd be looking and say, uh-oh, I think we need to turn around and go in another direction. You know, this is not a good place to be right now. And she's totally oblivious to it because it just doesn't happen in Singapore. So she, she won't war- recognize the warning signs. Yeah, yeah. So what about um, cost of living? Because when I was over there, I went to buy <laughs> a beer and I it was about, I think it was like $12. I think actually what it was, I went into some place and the guy was like, you have a card? I think it, he was going to like take the card and then mm. take my bank card. Okay. It wasn't, I don't know, it was like some fancy place. And, and I was just like, we're going to run a tab, sir, but we need to take your card. And I was just thinking, I only want a couple of beers. Like, what's the big problem? And then yeah. I looked at the menu and the beers were like $20, $22. And I was like, right, I'm not, I'm not having <laughs> beers in here. Yeah, I, I must admit, I'm because my wife doesn't drink. Um, She's actually allergic to alcohol, which must be a terrible thing to be. Um, so I don't tend to go out to pubs because it's just boring for her. So I more drink at home, so it's a bit cheaper. But yeah, generally speaking, alcohol is very expensive here, um, particularly in bars and restaurants. That thing that I say they want to take your card, yeah, that's quite, even when I first came to Singapore, that was quite normal for people just to leave their card behind the bar. And which to me is, I never liked the thought of that because, you know, even in Singapore, people could be skimming that card, they could be cloning it or whatever. So, but it's quite a, a normal thing, yeah. So if you go to a bar, yeah, typical prices for you have fifteen Singapore dollars for a pint, maybe more. That'll be that'll be quite a low price. And then yeah, you go into the into some, especially if you go for those um kind of craft beers, then it's like you know seventeen or eighteen dollars a pint. Yeah. So it's, I mean, you, I don't. It's not even shock to me anymore. I'm just used to it. So it's um. What about day to day kind of cost of living, like uh, food prices, uh, uh, rent, and stuff like that? Is it re- like are we coming in at like European prices or? Yeah, yeah, you you find that um, recently, especially rent has gone up crazy. Uh, I'm so glad I'm not. We actually, uh, I stay in what's called a um, or I own a, a um, HDB flat with my wife, a Housing Development Board, which is kind of the government's government flats, but they're not like council flats we have in Dublin. It's a whole different, um, I could explain later, but it's a whole different kind of strata of, of housing. Um, and we actually paid that off last year. We finished, finished off our mortgage last year. And I'm so grateful because I see expats who are, who are been paying rent, rents and the rents have doubled. This, they're actually doubled or tripled in the last year or so. Um, Why is that? There's a, because there's more and more expats coming back. So after COVID, a lot of stuff closed down. Um, a lot of, condominiums private apartments were not being built anymore because there was no construction going on so everything came, came to a halt then the uh, singapore's economy was actually very well managed during the COVID thing so they actually bounced back really fast and so they're opened their doors nobody wants to live in hong kong anymore because of the restrictions there so a lot of them were moving to singapore they have they're working for big companies with big pockets so okay you want to double the price price of a condo uh, you know the landlord can i can earn twice by hiring, by renting out my apartment to somebody from say who's coming in from Hong Kong versus the tenant who's been there for the last three years. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I know of a number of people that are basically constantly downsizing. So they went from like a three bedroom apartment, they're down to like a two bedroom or even a one bedroom. Um, so that's it's become particularly bad in the last year or so, in the last six months or so. And they don't think it's going to get any better until the, until you know, until constru- construction is restarted again, but it's going to be a while before all those new flats are built and, and so forth. So there is this, this imbalance going on. Um, so that's one thing. So rent, is, rent in Singapore has always been kind of expensive because, like I said, it's a five and a half million people on an island that's actually pretty small. 
Um, so you're, it's always going to be that way. Um, other, other things I would say, if you're a basic food, if you're into like normal Asian food, you can eat fairly cheaply here. That's okay. It's not, not too bad. Um, lunch could be maybe, depends what part of the city you're in, where, I'm, where I work because I'm working in the central business district. Lunch could be easily be 10 bucks, $10. Um, uh, then if you're further out, it can be like $5 to $8. Um, so that, that's fairly manageable. That's, that's okay. Um, public transport is relatively cheap because cars are ridiculously priced. I haven't driven since I came to Singapore and I don't need a car. As you pointed out earlier, the public transport is so efficient. You don't need a car. The cars are outrageously priced here. It's like, it's a status symbol to have a car. So, you know, we want to I think they're like level. double or triple the price of a, of a European car. Easily. Easily. Um, uh, and there's a, what they call a certificate of entitlement, which means you uh, it's just entitled to actually have a car, <laughs> which you have to pay for as well. You bid on the open market. It's a bid. It's not like a, a fixed price. So it changes from every quarter when they come up with a new COE price, it, it actually changes. So it's if you want to buy a new car, then you have to get the COE as well. So it's, it's uh, so complicated. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with the public transport system between buses and, and uh, MRT. And then taxis are relatively cheap here as well. I, I don't, you know, I've never needed a car. Maybe if I had very young kids, maybe, but that's about it. And like, do you ever miss Ireland or do you ever think like, what would have happened if I had stayed or would you ever go back and live in Ireland or is that, is that on the cards anytime? Uh, realistically, uh, yeah, I don't think so. It doesn't look like it now. At, at one stage, my wife was saying, oh yeah, maybe we can retire, you know, because uh, my wife has a son from a previous marriage. So we figure once he's old enough, you know, we can look at back at, you know, he's able to look after himself. We can go back to Ireland and all that. And he, he, I can go back to Ireland. She can come with me and then we, we can have a nice quiet life in Ireland and stuff. But now that actually hasn't happened. I think it's the usual thing. She doesn't want to leave her beloved son behind. And I can't blame her for that. Um, it's so realistic. I can't see myself moving back. I mean, my parents are no longer around. And that's one of the things they don't, one of the things you yeah, that you don't really think about when you first become like an expat and the, the glamour of living overseas. It's like also when family things happen and you're not around, it's a pretty horrible experience. So I've got a younger, I've got one brother who's based back in Ireland. He's doing, he, he has a, quite a successful business of his own. And then I've got a, uh, my youngest brother who's working for Microsoft in Seattle. So there's not really a huge draw for me to go back to Ireland. Most of my friendships now are in Singapore. Most of my connections, my business connections, if I want to continue my business, are in Singapore. So I, like I said, it's the family I would have missed, not, not the place so much. When I go back, yeah, I enjoy Ireland for the first week or so. I mean, I do I always, in, you know, it's that moment when the plane touches down at Dublin Airport. That's when you're, this is great. This is great. But usually by the time we're going back, I'm quite happy to be going back. And there's that weird <laughs> feeling that when the plane touches down in Changi Airport, we always travel by Singapore Airlines because my wife prefers that. They always say, uh, they always say, like, and a very warm welcome to all Singapore re uh, citizens and per um, or residents and permanent residents. And you get that real homecoming feeling, which is very strange. When at first, I, it, it happened after a couple of years here, I start to feel more at home in Singapore than back in Ireland. And it's been like that ever since. So I. And yeah, do you think I, that you could retire in Singapore, like in the city, you know, like kind of like a city life retirement whenever whenever you're going to retire i'm not saying you're going to retire anytime soon but what i'm saying would you go to thailand and and live there or like down by the beach or something i remember thinking i could actually we own our hdb flat here i can rent that out and off the rent alone i get in singapore i can have a very nice comfortable life for myself and my wife in in pataya we can rent a condo and have a nice comfortable life and have our medical insurance covered without even touching whatever my savings are so there's that kind of curiosity, but then what, I'd be bored stiff if I had nothing else, nothing to do, you know? So, um, so that is kind of a thought that's at the back of my mind, but I think my wife is very keen about staying on in Singapore. Quite what we're going to do in the years to come, I don't know, but I don't see myself retiring that soon anyway. So it's not really, maybe I'll just keep kicking that particular ball up the road, you know, and just, I'll see what happens later. You mentioned that in the email to me that you, um, you're thinking about becoming applying to become a Singaporean resident, but that would mean that you're forfeiting your Irish uh, citizenship. 
does how do you feel about that i was thinking about that you know it's a big deal for certain irish people you know we've our whole history is is all about we've you know men and women have died so we'd have this so we'd have our passports you know it's it's very irish people are we're very passionate about our history yeah uh, what do you think exactly what's going through what you're saying it's a it's been something I've been thinking about for a couple of years. For me now, at my age, and you know, I have what's called a permanent resident. So I'm, it, and then we renew that every five years. Or you, there's an embarkation card whenever you renew that you renew, but you keep your permanent residency. See, it's not really permanent. If the government wants to kick you out, they can. Um, but moving forward, if I ever want to retire here, then it would make sense for me more to become a Singaporean to become a Singapore citizen. But at this stage, because you know, they say. The best way for me to do that would be for my wife to apply for me. That, that's the way I'd go to her. She'd actually go online and then she'd apply for me. Um, and it's some, I've been looking at it only in the last couple of years because I realized that, look, it's unlikely that we're going to go back to Ireland for, for any considerable length of time you know, to, to live there. Uh, so maybe I should really look at it into staying in Singapore. But then I had this emotional roller coaster going on. Yes, there's, there is this whole thing. This is Ireland. This is my ad- identity. You know, I, I see myself as Irish. I take pride in it. You know, I, it's, you, you know, you, you, you never really lose it, right? You, you go anywhere, you see an Irish bar, even overseas, and you, you kind of want to step inside, even though you know it's a very cliche thing to do. Um, so there's that emotional thing, that, but there's also the practical thing. As an, as an, with a Euro, you know, Irish passport, you can, go, you can retire to anywhere in Europe, right? You can just, hey, back it, I'll just go to Crete. I live in Crete, or I live yeah. in, you know, you know or, or Portugal or somewhere like that. Decent weather. Cheaper, you know, cheap, um, cheaper place to live. You can do that. So that's what I will be giving up. So there is that practical side of it as well. Um, so, but I, it, it's just something I read to. I, I haven't really settled in my own heart yet, but it really looks like that's what's going to going to be the case. I I want to say I, I compliment you on your interview style because you you tend to you shut up and let people talk. You you tend to and but you keep them on track, which is. Uh, really good i've seen other interviewers where they just tend to spend more time talking than the person they're interviewing yeah so I, I, you handle it right and you're not afraid to ask some some fairly blunt questions as well which is great i, I saw your interview with tony huge that oh, bodybuilder God, guy tony <laughs> there is a very strange character but <laughs> yeah he's he's but, yeah he's nuts tony's nuts and that was my first one that was like um I knew when I was doing that like 5 minutes into it i was just my eyes just started going i was like oh shit this is going to be a big but what yeah. if, like this is not this is not like one or two thousand views this is i was like this is viral yeah this is gonna go viral and i was thinking do i do i want this so that's what i was saying to him i i suppose my i was a little bit judgmental with him i was like tony 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 what's going on i'd handle yeah. that a little bit differently now with after the experience yeah but uh yeah that was wild well no that, that look of kind of like what the fuck is it was actually good when i got real, back you know? here my yeah. got back here, like I met p- people here, and they were like, "It was just great to see like a Dublin lad talking to this American guy." And a Dublin guy was giving him shit, like, "What's going on? Like, what's your yeah. mother think? What you're doing?" <laughs> yeah, I, love, I love that. It was, uh, and he actually, it, it stopped him. You know, he was like, you could see he got a bit emotional about it. For what I can say, it's like, is this really what he said? Uh, yeah. It was, it was great. You know, because I had to take about ten minutes out of that, where he yeah. just went into graphic detail about Lady Boys and what he does with them, like. He went into serious detail. I was like, Tony, there's no need. Like, we don't need to know the ins and outs of what you do. Like, literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah he, he's, he's got no filter, that guy. He is, but I mean, that's how he makes his money is by doing this kind of stuff. So, but anyway, Connor, we better finish this up. I actually yeah, yeah. have a black tie event oh. <laughs> going off to Kenny now. Noon oh. is work or having a black tie. So I'm jumping in the car and I'm heading off with a tuxedo on. <laughs> oh, that's. That you need to have that photograph of that in your YouTube channel. Yeah, I will put it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, Connor, I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, if you're in Dublin, right, next time you're in Dublin, it could be next year or in a couple of years' time, send me an email and we'll meet up for a Guinness. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. I'm sure you'll know where the good Guinnesses are because I've I've forgotten that where the best oh, yeah. Guinnesses is. Oh, yeah, I know. I'll take you. I'll take you some good spots. But anyway, I'll take it easy to. and uh, we'll, we'll chat on email. Okay, you take care. Okay. Okay, take care, Connor. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.